Good evening. I'm Stuart Brand from the Long Now Foundation. And I have a feeling this is an exceptional audience. How many here have not been to one of these uh, seminars about long-term thinking for Long Now before? Um, let me explain a little bit about one of the things that you'll be involved in, which is that the introduction cards you've got, which are instead of me giving a long introduction, have a question space on the back. And the format for this evening is that it will be on the stage uh, for about an hour. And 20 minutes before the end of that, um, I and Kevin Kelly, having gone through questions that you've sent up, held up, written your question, held it up, and it'll come up to the front, and I'll bring the questions we have at that point up to the stage. And so uh, be thinking about your questions uh, during the early part of the talk and get them up to us, and then we'll proceed. This one is an interview, and um, the interviewer, I think this is the fifth time on the stage, Peter Schwartz is also one of the founding directors of the Long Now Foundation, and the author of a book called uh, The Long View, about scenario planning. The person he'll be interviewing is a government worker. <laughs> and one of the things we've noticed about governments over a few decades now, about thinking about long-term thinking, is that it's one of the things that societies charge governments with, is taking long-term seriously and thinking seriously about how to manage that and take responsibility over decades and even centuries. Many other institutions humans are involved in do not do that, but it's one of the things we pay taxes to our governments to take on. Probably one of the most experienced people in the world at dealing uh, with government at the highest level is our guest tonight, Secretary George P. Schultz. Peter, all yours. So look, it's my honor to be on stage with you, Secretary Schultz. Uh, I think uh, you're one of the only people who's ever held four cabinet positions, you and Elliot Richardson. Uh, you've served in the military. You've been an academic. I wasn't just in the military. I, was a, I am a Marine. Yeah. <laughs> Semper Fi, anybody here? An artillery captain in the Marines. We'll come back to that experience. The Marines, you've been a professor, you've been in the government. As far as I can tell, you've, the only job you haven't had is Pope. <laughs> and, and maybe we can work on that one for the next time. A little business job. too. Yeah, that's a business too, obviously. So what I, what I want to do uh, today, just so you all know, is uh, we have an enormously rich history that we can't possibly cover in the next hour, but I'm going to try and cover at least some of the big uh, lessons from your life uh, in the first 20 minutes or so. Then we'll turn to sort of the modern world, where we are today and where we're going, what it implies for the future, and then we'll open it up for questions from all of you. That makes sense? Okay. What if they say it doesn't make sense? <laughs> uh, then we're in trouble. Uh, so when you were a student at Princeton, in the uh, late 30s, early 40s. You studied economics, but you also started, studied government affairs. Uh, was, was public service always on your mind? Well, Princeton had a motto, Princeton and the nation's service. So the atmosphere was, that's a good thing. But what I was part of, in addition to economics, was what's called the School of Public and International Affairs. And they had an interesting thing. Each uh, semester, one semester would be a domestic issue, Another semester, an international issue. So you international, you'd have a role. Somebody would be the foreign minister of Japan. Somebody else would be the secretary of the treasury, and so on. So you'd study what would, if you were the foreign minister of Japan, what would be on your mind, and then you'd have discussions. And it was very educational, I thought. So after school, you went uh, to the Marines. You enlisted in uh, the Marines. You ended up a captain uh, in the South Pacific. Uh, and you served in the Battle of Peleliu, uh, that was... Uh, we called it Peleliu. Peleliu? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Peleliu. Uh, uh, General uh, William Rupertos thought it was going to take four days to win that fight. Instead, it was a couple of months. What did you learn from the, 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 the challenge of a huge battle that turned out to be much more problematic than you expected? Well, you, have, you don't know what's going to happen. 
<clears throat> so you have to be ready. But I remember in the early days, these invasions are fantastic things. You look out, there's ships everywhere, and planes and so on, it's an amazing armada. And you land, and then the supplies come in on the beach, and it's relentless. So I go in about the second wave, and <clears throat> the Japanese were, there were caves on the walls on each side of the beach. The Japanese were in these caves taking pot shots, and they sort of shut down the beach. So everything was stalled, we were making headway going in. So I sort of took command without anybody having me in charge of anything, and I said to the guys, okay, you shoot in that little hole, and you shoot in that little hole, and you shoot in that little hole, and we'll shut the Japanese down. And then we could get stuff on the beach. And uh, that worked. So uh, taking I, command worked. I, I learned that uh, if there's something obvious, get it done, it'll do. <laughs> That's a pretty good lesson. <laughs> so, okay, you, you, we win the Battle of Peleliu. Uh, now it's after the war. Uh, you're professor at University of Chicago. Uh, among the most important people around the University of Chicago at that time was Milton Friedman, uh, uh, father man. of a lot of modern economics. What, what did that experience ha ha have an effect on you? Well, the University of Chicago had the most intense intellectual atmosphere anywhere. You go to lunch and you talk. I remember once I came back to, you know, I just flunked lunch. <laughs> because it's supposed to. But Milton was a relentless arguer. And his pal was George Stigler, who right. was fun. George's office is right opposite mine. George and I played golf a lot together. So Milton was there a lot, and I got to know them very well. And at one point <clears throat> in the Vietnam War, were you born then? Uh, just barely. <laughs> just barely. Well, in the Vietnam War, uh, the students were active about it. And I was dean of the business school. And the Dow Chemical Company came to interview. And when that happens, they put up a sheet and students sign when they want to be interviewed. So they had a big turnout of students at one of them. And they produced napalm for the Defense Department. And there was a big hue and cry about it. And the head of the university got a hold of me and said, can't you cancel this? I said, no. The students invited them here. It's free speech. You have Nazis come. You have communists come. Why can't a company come? Just because they make napalm for the Defense Department. It's a perfectly good thing. But they persisted. And then one of the trustees said, I will hire a suite in the Palmer House. Two suites, he said. And I'll have three limousines. We'll take students back and forth, and they can be interviewed there. I said, no, they're going to be interviewed on the campus. So then there were two faculty meetings. And I had on my side Milton Friedman and George Stigler. And Milton was the most severe arguer on anything. You have. And once he's on your side, man, you're going to win. <laughs> and George had this ability to take something you've said and twist it around and get everybody laughing at you. So we had two faculty meetings, and finally my side won. So we had the interviews, it worked, no problems. The only concession I made was I got my wife to make some sandwiches and I took them in and I invited the Dow Chemical Company to have a, come and have lunch with me so I didn't have to go out. Hans Morgenthau had a demonstration. But it, it was a lesson, stand up to these things. And it's important, free speech is important. On the other hand, I was one of the student demonstrators at RPI against Dow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we move on now. <laughs> That was like a confession. You were wrong. <laughs> so we come out of the University of Chicago, uh, and you're recruited for the Nixon administration. Secretary of Labor, or was it OMB first? Secretary of Labor. Secretary of Labor. And I think something people don't really recognize is, uh, you know, a lot of, I was a student demonstrator. I was anti-war. I was not a big fan of Richard Nixon. But some remarkable things happened under Nixon. He didn't start the war. Kennedy and Johnson, right. he inherited it. Agreed. But you did some remarkable things as Secretary of Labor. And one of the really interesting things was around labor unions. And in particular, the construction workers in Philadelphia, when you uh, tackled integration in the labor unions and the inability or, the, of, of blacks to get jobs in construction. Tell us about that. Well, I... When I became Secretary of Labor, they told me it was an impossible job for a Republican because the department was a wholly owned subsidiary of the AFL-CIO. 
And I brought in a really good people, bunch of people, and the staff there knocked themselves out for us. So I always say the people who are in government, the permanent career people, they are there to serve. And if you'll work with them, they'll work with you. But at any rate, uh, one of the jobs of the Secretary of Labor at the time was to worry about discrimination in the workplace. And I had quite a lot of experience with it beforehand. And we found in Philadelphia, there were no blacks in the, in the skilled construction trades at all, zero, for a long period. And it was obvious there were perfectly skilled people around there. And so we, don't, we developed something that called the Philadelphia Plan. We said, you've got to get some people here and hire them and let's have some objectives and let's have some timetables for doing it. So that became very controversial in Washington. And I'm hauled before a Senate committee. I'm there, you know, they sit up here and they look down on you. And so they said, you're trying to establish a quota system. I said, I'm trying to replace one. <laughs> it's been a quota system here for a long time. The, the quota has been zero. It's been very effective. And the only way to break it up is to hit it with a sledgehammer, and that's what I'm trying to do. But at any rate, there was finally a vote in the Senate, and the Republican leader, Hugh Scott, from Pennsylvania, gave me his score sheet. After it was done, I have it framed in my office. My side won by 10 votes, Republicans and Democrats on both sides of the issue. But at any rate, it was a lesson, and I was very uh, <clears throat> heartened by the fact that President Nixon supported me all the way without hesitation. I had learned something about him earlier, though. <clears throat> he was a strategist. If you went to him with just something, no strategy, he didn't like it. But if you had a strategy. So I had been very critical as a professor at the University of Chicago at the tendency in the Kennedy and Johnson administrations to intervene in big labor disputes, bring them to the White House, big deal. And I said, when you do that, you're ruining private bargaining. Because if I'm going to come to the White House, I'm not going to make my breast offer until I get there, right? So that kills private bargaining. And they were intervening in cases they claimed would cause a national emergency, which I didn't think they would. So there was a strike on the East Coast longshoremen and Gulf Coast in 1968, and President Johnson used the Taft-Hartley Act to enjoin the strike. In the act, there's a provision for a fast-track appeal to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court agreed with the president, so the injunction holds, and it expires sometime in the middle of January 1969, and I'm sworn in as Secretary of Labor on January 21st, and the press says, okay, Professor Schultz, now you are Secretary of Labor. What are you gonna do? So I went to the president, and I explained to him, I said, your predecessor was wrong, the Supreme Court was wrong, this will not cause a national emergency. It'll cause a lot of our people in New York City. They think that's a national emergency, but it isn't. The economy, <laughs> is, economy is resilient. And if you can hang in for four to six weeks, once the parties realize they're not coming to the White House, I can get this mediated out. And, and? that's the way it worked. And so I got a, I, in one hand I saw with Nixon, if you went to him with a strategy, then he would, work with it. If he didn't have any strategy, he didn't like that. But he was a strategist. Well, look, you know, I, I suspect uh, there's a number of people of my generation here who, who had a very different view, like I did, of Richard Nixon at the time. But in hindsight, looking back, these two events we've just referred to, the birth of the EPA, HEW, many of the kind of modern institutions of governance were born under Nixon. H how do we explain this apparent contradiction between the Richard Nixon that lots of people loathe and this remarkably creative moment in governance? Well, there was a, he was a man of two sides, apparently, I later learned. And you have the transcripts of the, the tapes, and you find he got with his little inner circle, and he was a different guy. And I've talked to Henry Kissinger about it. He said, I never saw that side of Nixon, neither did I. I saw the positive side. For instance, people don't realize that in 1970, the schools in seven southern states were still segregated by law. This is decades after the Brown decision. So in 1970, Nixon, for reasons I don't know, decided it was time to end it. And, <clears throat> but he, and he realized that you had to manage that. So he appoints Vice President Agnew to be the chairman of a committee and me the vice chairman. 
and Agnew would have nothing to do with it, didn't want to touch it, so I become the chairman. <laughs> <clears throat> and I, in the White House at that time was Pat Moynihan, he was a great friend and a good guy, and a lawyer named Len Garment and a former advance man named Morgan. <clears throat> so that was my team. And we decided, and I went to the president, I said, Mr. President, we're gonna form biracial committees in each state, seven states. So we're not going to pay any attention to their political party affiliation. We don't care. We just want to have strong, respected people. So that's what we got. And I remember the first group we brought to the White House was from Mississippi. Everybody thought they'd be the toughest state. So we brought them into the Roosevelt Room in the White House. And I knew from my labor relations experience, people like to blow up steam. And as long as they're arguing principle, you didn't get anywhere. So I let him blow off steam for about a half an hour. And then I called in the Attorney General. I said, what are you gonna do when the school's open, Mr. Attorney General? He said, I'm gonna enforce the law. Thank you. So I said, okay, it's been an interesting discussion this morning, but it's not relevant. It's gonna happen. And the only question is, is it gonna be violence? What's gonna to happen to the schools? These are your children, these are your schools, these are your communities. So what are we gonna, what's the problems and what can we do? And I have found that when, once you get Americans into a problem-solving frame of mind, they get very constructive, and that's what happened. And by three o'clock in the afternoon, we were in good shape, and I took him across the hall to the Oval Office, <clears throat> and the president said, here we are in the Oval Office. Think of the decisions that have been made here that have affected the security and welfare of our country. He said, well, I've made my decision on this issue, but in our country, that's not enough. <coughs> You have to make your decision. <coughs> and that's why you're here, and we'll work with you. And he inspired them, and we did work. But then we came to this last state, which was Louisiana, and Pat and I thought, we could do this, we could bring it off. And why don't we have the last one down in their hometown in Louisiana, and we can bring it off there, and then we'll have a meeting of all the chairman, co-chairman of the different states, have them all together and to kind of kick off the school year was getting close. So the Nobel office meeting is held. I make my pitch to the president, the pitch turns to Agnew and Pre Vice President Agnew says, Mr. President, don't go. They'll you be in a room and half the people will be black, half the people will be white. There's gonna be blood running through the streets of the South, don't go. So the president looks at me, I'm the non-politician in the room. I said, well, Mr. President, whatever happens, it's on your watch. And you've met with these people and they've come up here and you inspired them. And they haven't been idle, they've been working and we've been working with them. And I think it's a good thing to go down there. So he agrees to go. So Pat and I go down the night before. We start meeting with people. It's going okay, but not like it usually does. And suddenly dawning me, it's one thing for to come and meet in the White House. It's another thing to meet in the hotel room in your hometown. It's not the same. But anyway, it was going. And then I get word the president is 10 minutes out and so on. So I had to go out and tell him, Mr. President, it isn't quite like it is when you usually meet with him. You've got to put this across yourself, which he did. And then we had the meeting of the uh, co-chairman of each of the groups. It was like a revival meeting. They're all saying, have you thought of this problem? Have you thought of that problem? What are you doing about it? Back and forth. It was really exciting and reassuring. <clears throat> so the schools opened and there was no violence, much to everybody's surprise. No violence, no bloodshed. Agno was totally wrong and it worked. So that was another good experience with Nixon. So we've now tackled Labor, we've tackled education. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, you're now Secretary of Treasury, uh, and uh, oil crisis hits, inflation takes off. Uh, lots of us can remember being in oil lines, uh, trying to find the open gas station, uh, uh, trying to find gasoline. Uh, inflation is now hitting 10, 12 percent. It's worse than that. Here's what happened. <laughs> I'm Secretary of Labor, and President Eisenhower had thought that if we imported more than 20% of the oil we used, we were asking for trouble. So we put in a quota system. And we're coming up close to that. So all of a sudden, the President makes me the chairman of a cabinet task force on the oil import program. 
and we work at it, and we produced a good report. It was published. And we said, there's obvious things. There's unsettled things in the Middle East, so we should get our imports from there down as much as we could. We ought to have a storage system, so we got a little insurance policy. We said, we know more about this subject than anybody in the government. There should be some place in the government that's keeping track of energy because it's a strategic resource. And a few other things like that. And that were perfectly obvious. The report was published. The president patted me on the head and said, thanks for a good report. There were congressional hearings. Nothing was done. So my lesson was it takes more than a strategic analysis to get something done. So then I'm Secretary of the Treasury, and here comes the Arab boycott, which was about what we predicted. And uh, there was a lot of um, <clears throat> electricity came from oil in those days. So Christmas lights were discouraged. Gas stations closed on weekends. It was a giant event. And in that area, all the things we recommended got done, one, two, three, four. So, so the next lesson I learned was if there's something critical, then you can get something done. But you get it done if you're ready. If you're not ready, the moment may go and you don't take advantage of it. So I learned two lessons out of that. But that also then took us to that moment when the currency system broke, the inflation rates, the different <coughs> moments, and you helped end the Bretton Woods system and create the new system of floating exchange rates that really transformed and liberated the world economy to be able to grow and develop. Well, what happened was the system that was in effect was based on gold. And we would offer to redeem gold at whatever that was. I forget the price. But anyway, the way things were working, there was more money, dollars out there than we had gold in Fort Knox. And there was starting to be a run on the bank, so to speak. So the president closed the gold window. And that changed the exchange rate system. <coughs> and I was director of the budget. And I kept asking the treasury people who were in charge, what's your plan? And they said, it's a secret. <laughs> so then I become Secretary of the Treasury. I said, okay, now what's the plan? They said, we don't have one. So that, that's what I thought. So I had to think of one. And my friend Milton Friedman, he was sort of an unofficial guy. I said to him, both Milton and I wanted to have a flexible exchange rate system. And my <clears throat> undersecretary, Paul Volcker, said that the Europeans and the Japanese insist on a power value system. So Milton and I worked at it, and we developed a floating exchange rate system in the clothing of a power value system. And something more or less like that is what's evolved. Kind of a semi-sloppy managed float. It's worked reasonably well. well yeah, but it's a, it's a loose enough system and a tight enough system that it actually is both manageable <coughs> and it actually works. And uh, you know that- When people go off of it, it doesn't work very well and they learn a lesson. It, pretty fast. Runs on banks currency crashes and the like. All right, so you've now reinvented labor, you've reinvented education and the schools, you've transformed currency. Let's move now to Secretary of State, okay? Uh, Ronald Reagan appoints you Secretary of State. Uh, you were the second one. It was Haig was there briefly first, uh, and he was moved aside, you come in. And the Reagan era was a remarkable era for many of us. But there were several moments that were really quite remarkable, and, and one of which was, of course, the Reykjavik summit, when uh, Reagan uh, and uh, Gorbachev and you uh, met at Reykjavik, something very similar to what has been happening in the last 24 hours. No, it way. wasn't similar at all. <laughs> Nothing. I in the first place, we had a way of approaching these things. And was, first of all, be realistic. Ronald Reagan said the Soviet Union was an evil empire. That was a realistic appraisal of what they were. Second, be strong. We had a military buildup. We had a strong economy. Then, and we had to have, you have to have a sense of purpose that people are behind you, that's strength. And then you say, let us figure out what our agenda is. What do we want? Don't pay attention to what the other side might agree to because it, the next thing you know, you'll be negotiating with yourself. Figure out what you want and then engage. So that's what we did. And we had negotiations going on and the Soviets, the Gorbachev was supposed to come to Washington and he said, let's have an interim preparatory meeting. And he said, London or Reykjavik, both NATO capitals. 
So we picked Reykjavik because it was relatively isolated. And we didn't know what he was going to build up, so we took a strong staff, and there was this little place called Hofti House, where an isolated little place, and there was a room on the first floor, not very big, about the big size of this rug, and Gorbachev is on one end, Reagan is on the other end, I'm sitting beside Reagan, Shevardnadze's beside Gorbachev, and we were there for two days, and we talk about everything, but the first thing happened was, Gorbachev starts making Soviet proposals that were all our proposals in our arms going on. And Reagan started to say something once. I put my hand on his arm. I said, let him talk. He's just coming our way. He's delivering. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it was an extraordinary time. And <clears throat> in this Hofti house, upstairs, there was a big sort of common room. And there was a room for us and a room for the Soviets. So in the course of that, Paul Nitze, who was a wonderful uh, public servant, worked with me was there, and he, he got to know in the common room Marshal Akramayev. Marshal Akramayev was the top military guy in the Soviet Union. And it turned out he liked James Fenimore Cooper, the last of the Mohicans. And Paul developed and got to know him. And so after the first day, there was an agreement that we have two working groups at night. And Paul would be the head of one of them for our side. And they were arguing with the Soviet experts who would be on the Soviet team and who would chair it. And Paul said, well, probably Akramayev. And all the Soviet experts said, he won't even be in the room. They never do that. Well, he comes to the meeting and Akramayev is not only there, he is totally in charge. Nobody says anything. So we learned from that, that in our negotiations, if Akramayev comes, they're ready to cut the mustard. If he isn't there, you're just gonna waste your time. He was the dominant figure. <clears throat> but there was another, negotiation too. A woman named Roz Ridgway was my assistant secretary and she negotiated with Ms. Mertnick here, Soviet opposite number, the first ever agreement that human rights would be a regular recognized item on our agenda. It was a breakthrough. So something- Incidentally, <coughs> see there are a number of women in the audience. It was an interesting time because in the mid 80s, 84 I guess or something like that, I had to have a new assistant secretary of state for what we call European affairs. This would be the point person in dealing with the Soviets. And so she would, who, the board, this person would work with me. And I worked very hard on it because it was important. And I decided there was a woman named Roseanne Ridgway who was the best possible person. And I talked it over with President Reagan and he agreed and we nominated her. Nothing happened. Then we started getting Word from the Senate back, aren't you going to withdraw this, this nomination? We said, no, we're not going to withdraw. And they said, well, but this is a very important, very difficult job. We don't think a woman can do this job. And we said, well, we think she can. That's why we nominated her. <coughs> and then Reagan, who was very sly about these things, he started letting the word creep out. They was thinking about making a public speech, calling on the Senate to give her a vote. If you want to vote, get against her because she's a woman, help yourself, but give her a vote. And all of a sudden they had a vote, and of course she was <laughs> confirmed. But then, um, but then I have problems within the government, and particularly with the hardliners and the DOD. And um, so we get to the Geneva summit, first summit between Reagan and Gorbachev. And Reagan had had the experience of being in the big G7 meetings. And there were always a pre-negotiated communique. And the pre-negotiated would have brackets in it. And they'd spend all their time talking about the brackets. And Reagan said, that's not a leader's meeting, that's a staff-driven meeting. I'm not gonna have a pre-negotiated communique. So that's what he said on the Geneva summit. Ambassador de Brennan came in, we can't have this to go, let's have a pre-negotiated. I said, this, my guy doesn't want one. And I said, by that time I'd gotten to know Gorbachev reasonably well. I said, if you push it, I bet you your guy doesn't want it either. They're both guys that want to grab their own. So anyway, we go to Geneva. And obviously, Braz is going to do the all-nighter to create a communique. And the meeting goes really quite well. And the last meeting was on Soviet territory. And we're standing, I'm standing with Gorbachev, Braz is there, and the Soviet people are going to negotiate over there. And I'm standing with Gorbachev and we see Reagan off. And so then I talked to Gorbachev, all the things that are accomplished. In other words, I'm sort of outlining 
would be in the communique. And he's agreeing and he's making things. And so then there's a nice dinner. Nancy Reagan knew how to throw a party. And she does this dinner party. And everybody's having a good time. And I got a phone call. It's Roz. She said, we've been sitting here for four hours. And these people act like they never heard what you and Gorbachev talked about. They're just back in the Cold War. And I'm just hanging tough. I said, hang tough. So I went back in, and somebody asked me what the phone call was. And I went after Gorbachev. I said, don't your people pay any attention to what you said? And so on. Nancy was upset because I messed up her dinner party. But, <laughs> <laughs> but then about 2 o'clock in the morning, the Soviets get a new instructions. And out of it came probably the best communique we ever got from one of these things. We didn't even call it a communique. We called it a joint statement to differentiate it. And Richard Pearl, who was one of the guys who was tough, had asked to be on the delegation. And I told him, OK, Richard, but you have to agree. Roz is 100% totally in charge. And afterwards, he came to me and he said, Roz Ridgway is the toughest, most skillful negotiator I have ever witnessed. Anytime I can be on her team, let me know. So that was the end of the problems with Roz. She proved herself by confidence. So you were there at the end of the Cold War. Uh, something you said to me that uh, trust is the coin of the realm. H how did you develop the trust with somebody like Gorbachev to enable to, the kind of steps that unfolded toward the end of the Reagan administration in what was then the Soviet Union to play out? Where did that trust come from? Well, I think you have to uh, develop a um, <clears throat> trusting relationship with people, friends or uh, enemies, whatever it is, if you're going to deal with them in any effective way. And the way to do it is to be straightforward. Don't leak things to the press. It's just a private discussion. And I developed that with Shevardnadze, with Wu Chen in China. And you, you don't go to the press. <coughs> you have discussions. <coughs> For instance, with China, I went and with Deng Xiaoping then was the chief guy. And Wu Chen was my counterpart. And I said, you put on the table everything you want to talk about. I'll put on the table everything I want to talk about. And we'll make an agenda out of that. And I'll agree to come here at least once a year. Uchi Chen, you'll come to the US once a year. And about three meetings a year where we both go to the same international meeting. And we'll, we'll agree to carve out about three hours just for us. And we'll work our way through this agenda. And the Chinese liked it a lot. It was very workmanlike. It was express. And nobody was no publicity about it at all. We just did these things. And we got so we trusted. And at one point, I said to Uchi Chen, I come to Beijing, you put me up in the state guest house, meetings are all in the Great Hall. So all I, uh, China, I understand it's a big country, but all I know is <coughs> there are two buildings on the road. <coughs> so he and his wife took my wife and I on a one-week trip around China. It was really very revealing. We went to Shenzhen. In Shenzhen, there's a place that's about an acre or so, and it's, a, um, it's China, and you can sort of walk around China. And then there are these buildings up above. I said, what are they? He said, well, these are Chinese chefs. You think there's Chinese food? There are about seven different chefs doing different kinds of food. So all of a sudden, it hit me hard what Deng Xiaoping had told me. Namely, there's great diversity in China. And so that's one of the things that people have to do in this world is learn how to manage over diversity. And diversity is everywhere. And I think right now China is trying to do it by suppression or ignoring it, and it's, they're, they're going to have to face up to it. So <coughs> thinking about kind of shifting our focus toward the future and where we are today and where we're going, and you, I think that was a, 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 a natural bridge. Um, thank you, Stuart. We, uh, we've lived in the last 50, 60 years through most of my life in a world economic system that you helped design and build. You're one of the architects and builders of the, the global system that has produced relative peace and prosperity for 65 years. It seems to be coming apart right now. It seems to be being torn apart. Uh, you've talked about three big forces, demography, technology, governance, as shaping the future. What's the future for the international system that is being pressed by giant forces like that and the politics of Washington today? Well, the politics of Washington is increasingly irrelevant. I think we're seeing the creation of what I call a new federalism, 
where we say, there's a problem here, and we're people in San Francisco, let's talk about them and solve them ourselves. And for instance, uh, I think one of the big things about the future, people don't realize how powerful it is, is the change in demographics that's going on. All of the major countries have falling fertility and rising longevity. It's sort of being turned upside down. It used to be the case where there was a lot of young people and a few older people, and that affected your retirement systems and everything. Now it's turned different. There are fewer young people, a lot more older people. So you've got to adjust to that. In Russia, China, Germany, Japan, working age populations are declining and certainly aren't going to continue. There are three countries where the fertility and longevity are true, but nevertheless, we're not declining in our working age population. Those three countries are the United States, Canada, and Australia. What do these three countries have in common? We're all immigrant countries. Every person here is an immigrant or descended from one. We're an immigrant country. I'm an immigrant. So, <clears throat> I was once, the guy who created Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, was a friend of mine. And he came to San Francisco. And I said, what are you doing here, Harry? And he said, well, there's something going on down at Stanford and Silicon Valley. And we need to find out about it in Singapore. Maybe we need to loosen up a little bit. So we're going to start a venture capital firm <coughs> and be part of it, what you people are doing in America. And I said, when you get down there, what you're going to find is there are people there from all over the world. He said, I know that, but it could only happen in America. So we attract the best and the brightest, and we also attract the people who have picked the strawberries. And it's worked well for us. I just hope we can keep it going. So immigration, what should be our immigration policy? Well, it's obvious. But people in, <laughs> in Washington uh, have a hard time with it. But things that happen, you say they're not us. There was a woman in Oakland who came here illegally 20 years or so ago. She's working as a nurse, doing a good job. She has three children, two of them grown up working, another one younger. And they come along, and she violated the law by coming in here, and they deported her. And we say, this is not us. And then you have this business of taking kids away from their parents. You say, and the idea that this is going to cause parents to sober up. You say, that's not us. That's not the way we do things. So we've got to change that. And have, you can have a regular immigration system that's legal. We do, so obviously, we want to get control of our borders. That works. And, but it's impossible to get anything passed in this legislation that we have. I might say, incidentally, that the... People coming from Central America, you ask, why are they coming? They're coming because economic conditions there are not good and there's terrific violence. What causes the violence? We do. Our war on drugs does. Because the gangs down there make huge amounts of money by selling drugs in the US and they buy guns and they have the money and they have more resources than the government does. And they create a lot of violence, and people want to get away from it. So if we want to do something about it, we should do something about our war on drugs. And what do we do? Well, it's perfectly obvious. This, <laughs> the war on drugs started in the Nixon administration, I remember. And the president thought, drugs are bad for you, so we should make them unavailable restrict the supply, and people, there's no supply, you can't take them, so that's a solve way to solve the problem. And so that was the approach. And Pat Moynihan was in the White House then, and he was sort of a self-appointed drug czar. And he and I are driving up to Camp David, and I have a presentation to make, so I'm, I'm director of the budget, and I'm studying my notes. And he interrupts me, he said, don't you realize we just had the biggest drug bust in history? I said, good work, he said. But this was in Marseille. We've broken the French connection. <laughs> And I said, great. And there was sort of a silence. And then he said to me, I suppose you think that as long as there is a big profitable demand for drugs in the United States, there will be a supply. I said, Moynihan, there's hope for you. <laughs> <coughs> but that's the problem. Now, in Portugal, they're doing something that seems to be working, and it's interesting. It's not illegal in 
drug drugs are not to take them or perhaps small scale possession, in other words, for personal use, it's not illegal. They've maintained their legality so they can go after pushers. And they invest heavily in treatment centers. So right now, if you are on drugs, you can get thrown in jail. The jails are full of people and they get an associated diseases. <clears throat> and um, so it doesn't work. And the cocaine use is higher in the US than in our OEC, other OECD countries. So it simply doesn't work. But in Portugal, you can go to a treatment center and with young people, they find they can really pro get most of them straightened out. Older confirmed addicts are harder to work with, but still they have a place to go. So the jails are emptying out and the pushers are gradually losing. They don't have the profitability and it's going away. So it's sort of it's working. It's a, a problem you have to work out. So uh, I'm gonna come, several of you have asked questions about the current politics and I'm gonna come back to that uh, uh, toward the end. But I want to stick with some of the, the kind of longer term forces first. You, you, when we were backstage, you were talking about both technology and governance, in your view, as transforming the world. But in, in what sense? Well, I, I think there are three things. One is demography. I've already talked about that. And then there's technology. Artificial intelligence, which really is machine learning, it gets a lot of publicity and it's really important to changing lots and lots of things. And then there's 3D printing which may in the end be more revolutionary. 3D printing means that you can produce most of the things you want close to where you are. So that'll lead to a kind of a de-globalization. De but it, it can, and, and, and it also means that you can produce small, very lethal, inexpensive weaponry that can be attached to drones which are cheap. So you can swarms of <coughs> armed drones it's going to have a big impact on security, and we need to be getting after that. And then, just as you have the challenges to government produced by uh, demography and technology, I think governments are worse and worse. Our own government, all they do is investigate each other in Washington. And if you look around Europe, you don't see anything very reassuring right now. And so the problems of government are increasingly difficult. And one reason is that everywhere you're governing over diversity and you have to learn how to do that. And mostly people don't know how to do that. I'll give you an example of somebody who does and that's my wonderful wife, Charlotte. She's the chief of protocol in, Cal in San Francisco. There is about 70 consulates in San Francisco. We're one of the most diverse cities in the world. So everybody has a national day like we have the 4th of July. So in every country's national day, she has a reception in City Hall. They fly that country's flag. They sing the national anthem and says, welcome. We're glad to have you here. Your diversity adds to our creativity. And you're here under the Golden Dome of San Francisco. So that's governing over diversity. You recognize it, but you also fit it into a larger whole. And I think people have to learn how to do that, but mostly they don't. So uh, Kevin Kelly asked a question, uh, and, and we've talked about this in a variety of ways over the, the, the years. Uh, his question was, in a few decades when China becomes the largest economy and then later the mightiest, mightiest military, what should the role of the U.S. be? Well, the U.S. should be in our foreign policy to be realistic about what's going on in the world, to recognize that Whatever the problems may be, we're part of the world, whether we like it or not. I always say that after World War II, some gifted people with the names like Truman and Atchison and Marshall and Clayton looked back and what did they see? They saw two world wars. The first settled in rather vindictive terms that helped lead to the second. They saw 60 million people were killed in the second world war. They saw the Holocaust. They saw the Great Depression. They saw the currency manipulation and protectionism that aggravated it. And they said to themselves, what a crummy world. And we are part of it, whether we like it or not. So they set out to change it. At Bretton, it wasn't dictation. It was working with people, but giving them leadership. At Bretton Woods, there were 44 countries represented. Then comes the Cold War, NATO. 
by the time the Cold War was over, there had been created a security and economic commons from which everybody benefited, including us. And that commons has fallen apart. And we have to recognize we're part of the world, whether we like it or not. And so we have to be part of a constructive effort to put the pieces back together again. It can be done, but we have to have that attitude. So what would be a step toward putting it back together again? Well, on the economic side, I mean, we're, we're talking about trade deals all the time. There's a piece that people forget, namely, that if a country consumes more than it produces, it will import more than it exports. That's not economics, that's not negotiation, that's arithmetic. <laughs> so you, you're not gonna get anywhere on the trade deficit by fooling around. You gotta do something about our spending habits if you're gonna do something about the trade deficit. So let's realize that a trading system is good. Why, why is a trade good? You don't make a trade unless you think it's good for you, right? So if we make a trade, we're both better off. That's what comparative advantage is all about. That's why economists are all for free trade. Now, sometimes people uh, mess up and they do things you don't like. I think it's fair enough to say that China has uh, taken advantage of things and has tried to steal our intellectual property and stuff like that, and they need to be chastised for that or work with to stop. And people all over the world agree with that point of view. And so there's a way of going about it, to, to do something about it. But we need to reconstruct a reasonable set of economic relationships. And then in, in the light of all of the pressures that are there for um, <coughs> a destabilization, getting some sort of understandings of violence and how we're gonna contain it is really important. And uh, I think so. And then I think they're cutting across all of this the spread of nuclear weapons. People have forgotten how devastating they are. A nuclear weapon drops in the Bay Area, it's wiped out, it's not here anymore. These are awful things. And then there's climate change. And climate change cuts across and could do us a huge amount of damage. So we need to be working on that issue very hard. So coming, I wanna stay with China for a moment and the US. So is the implication of what you said that we need to find a way to collaborate with China in helping to build a new world order? Or are we inherently rivals? We're not inherently rivals with anybody. We, we can have economic competition and so on. But we, China is interested in a, um, a profitable world where they can get along. And so we need to be able to work with them. And just what the current situation is exactly, I'm too far away from it, but I have had a couple of occasions to meet with Xi. And I was struck by him. Do you trust him? Well, I don't know. I would see um, if I were there, if I could develop that kind of relationship. But we had, used to have a track too with China, Henry Kissinger and I and a few other people. And before he was president, but he was designated, he was going to be, we were in Beijing and he gave a dinner for us. And I sat next to him at dinner. And I knew he was going to Washington, so I said, why don't you stop in San Francisco on your way to Washington? We have a Chinese-American mayor, and they're doing a good job, and, and you'll be welcome there. And he said, well, I'd like to do it, but I've already agreed to stop in Los Angeles. But then he said, if I came there, what I would really do is like to go down to Stanford and Silicon Valley, where something interesting is going on, and I know you can't find out about it by just reading about it. You've got to talk to people and get a feel for it. So I was fascinated that he knew that, and he had that point of view about how you learn. Then, and, um, then there's something called the Sunnyland Summit in the Obama period. And she sends word that he wants to come a day early and bring his wife. That's a statement that I want to get to know you and be able to have candid conversations where we can really dig into things and get somewhere. And my wife, Charlotte, gets an SOS from the State Department. Would she go down to Orange County Airport and help out? She gets down there. There is no high federal official there to meet the incoming president of China. Nobody. So 
The first lady sends word that she can't come at all because there's a birthday of one of her children, which turned out to be the following week. So Charlotte sends an SOS to Jerry Brown, and he comes with Ann. So at least somebody's there to meet him. Then the president of China cools his heels for a day. Charlotte entertains the first lady. I said, what's she like? Oh, she's a beautiful woman. She's fun. She's stylish. She's interested in everything. She has an operatic quality voice. They have to keep her stage appearances down. Well, she'll be more popular than her husband. But anyway, a winner. So the president of China cools his heels. This is not just a missed opportunity. This is an insult. And that's not the way you get along with people. Now, what you could do now, I don't know. But at least I know that when I was in office, we had a very constructive working relationship with the Chinese. So at least at that time, it was possible. And at least the little contacts with have, I've had with President Xi, he's a person you could work with. But I just say that from a distance. I don't know. So I, I want to ask one last question, of, uh, a, a kind of a, a deeper sense, before I turn to the, the, the present climate. Um, Nick, uh, who's a member of the Young Professionals of Foreign Policy. Where are you out there, Nick? Oh, there you are. Okay. So this is a, a young future Secretary of State up here. Um, and he asked the question, uh, what skills and experiences do the next generation of civil service and foreign service workers need? If you, were, you are an educator. You were educating the young future government leaders. What would you say to them? I would say, first of all, study, but learn from your experience. Experience is a great teacher. Now, here are three things I learned from my service in the Marine Corps, to take, to take examples. I remember I'm in boot camp at the start of World War II. Sergeant hands me my rifle, and he says to me, take good care of this rifle, this is your best friend. And remember one thing, never point this rifle at anybody unless you're willing to pull the trigger. No empty threats. Boot camp wisdom. We see this boot camp wisdom violated all the time. And you make an empty threat, and your word isn't worth anything anymore. So you, you can't, I remember Obama drew a bright red line against the use of chemical weapons in Syria, and they were used, and he did nothing. So that takes all the wind out of your sails. So that's one lesson I learned. Then another lesson, I'm, I go from college to boot camp to artillery school overseas, bing, 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 bing. So all of a sudden, I'm in war, and there's action going on. And you have, and you, you, when you're in, you become very tight relationships, it isn't just officers, men. You're, and I had a sergeant named Patton that I th was very close to, and he was a terrific guy. And we have this action, I'm looking around for Patton, I run over with him, and where the hell is Patton? Patton's dead, sir. I'll never forget it. The reality of war sinks in. Wonderful people get killed. So if you're in a position, to have an impact on a president's decision to send people into battle, remember Patton, be careful, have a good mission, equip people to win, and so on. So I learned that. Then we had another incident. We had taken this island, and, there was, and we were there, and there was a nearby island where the natives were. And the natives made log canoes and grass skirts and stuff. The Marines liked to go over and buy them and send them home for souvenirs. So I go over with the Marines, and we said, you, you can be here for two hours, and then you have to go back. So the Marines obviously wanted to make deals. And I observed this, and the natives enjoyed the bargaining process. So if one party wants to make deals and the other enjoys the bargain, guess what's going to happen to the prices? So finally, I had to step in, look, you've set a price, and they can decide to buy or not. But then, So I learned from that that if you want to deal too much, you're going to get your head handed to you. <laughs> And I can remember testifying before Congress when I was Secretary of State, and they would say, aren't you worried you haven't made a deal with the Soviet Union? And I said, we're not interested in a deal. We're only interested in a good deal. And so if this good deal comes along, we'll take it. But no, deals for deal's sake are not worth anything. So I learned that. So I say, think about your experiences, and you'll learn a lot from those experiences. Uh, Stuart, uh, we started 10 minutes late. Do we have 10 more minutes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, you didn't I, ask me. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, okay, so... 
before we, one final question before we turn to the, the, the difficult moment of today. When you look back at your own rather remarkable career, is there something that really stands out as the thing you're most proud of, that your greatest achievement? Well, you can't help but say helping bring an end to the Cold War was a big deal. Yeah. But I think my most um, thrilling moment as Secretary of State was this one. I worked hard on the problem of Soviet Jewry in many ways, as did President Reagan. And there was a woman named Eden Rudell, who I met with when I went to Moscow. And you work over these people, and it's sort of impossible. And there they are in this repressive state, and you'd like to see something happen, but it doesn't happen. And one time I had a negotiation with Shevardnadze, and he asked for a list of names. I put her name on the list. I'm sitting in my office in the State Department. Phone rings. I answer, and it says, this is Eden Udell. I'm in Jerusalem. I'm home. That's my top moment. Wow. And you feel as though some, you had something to do with a human being better off. That's what gives you satisfaction. That's a great answer. Great answer. All right. Let's get to the difficult. There are several questions that relate to the current politics. So let me just ask the, the, the several questions, and you can choose how you wish to answer them, uh, because they're, they're, they're all challenging in their own way. One question deals with, can we imagine a return to a bipartisan Washington where the parties can collaborate? Uh, today's meeting with uh, Putin, between Trump and Putin. What's up? Asked Kayla Horowitz. The other, <laughs> uh, by the way, the, the, the question of I would say not what's up, what's down. <laughs> oh. Uh, Gina Rakanova asked the question about uh, 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 how we restore bipartisanism. Uh, John Brennan made a rather strong set of statements today about uh, Mr. Trump, calling it his behavior treasonous. And Stuart Brand wants to, uh, that question was from Derek Schwartz, and Stuart wants to know how do you fix the Republican Party? So there's a whole set of concerns about what's going on in Washington, what's happening with this administration, the divides politically. How do you advise people in this kind of a world? I think the professional groups, the intelligence community, the FBI, have made a very bad mistake in being public. When I see the head of the CIA on Meet the Press, I say, are you crazy? As soon as you are out in public like that, you're pol political. I remember the first NSC meeting I went to, um, a man named Dick Helms was CIA director, and Dick briefed, answered questions, and then we turned to policy, and he got up and left the room. His hand hung around the White House in case they needed to have him come back and inform us. But he made a sharp distinction between intelligence and policy. He did not want to be involved in policy for fear it would mess up his intelligence. Now these people have gone off of that, and we are paying a price. And we are wondering about the intelligence. And the same is true in the FBI. Some of these things, you look at what the FBI has done, you say, what's the matter with these people? That's a professional group. They should stay out of the press and stay out of politics. And so I think that's a problem. But as far as bipartisan is concerned, it's, I just don't understand it. But I would say one of the things I learned was you, you don't want things to be necessarily bipartisan. You want to convert them into something that's nonpartisan. Our 1986 Tax Act, which was very sweeping, passed the Senate 97 to 3. And it was introduced in the House by Dick Gephardt, who was the Democratic leader. Bill Bradley had the laboring war in the Senate. And somebody asked President Reagan if it bothered him two Democrats introduced this legislation. It was his proposal. And he said it passed, didn't it? <laughs> so those were the days. Can we bring it back? Is there anything we can do to, re I know many of us are frustrated by the fact that Washington is paralyzed by the current lack of <coughs> nonpartisan uh, uh, views. How, what can we do? I don't know, but I know this. Most people in Washington don't live there. Paul Ryan, for instance, had a cot in his office. His family is back in Wisconsin. He said he, he's leaving because he doesn't, wants to be a full-time dad. You can't be, but they're not there. It used to be different. The Secretary of State has a nice little dining room, and you can get the President's box in the Kennedy Center anytime you want it. So I used to have 
get six or seven couples to come in and have supper and go to the Kenny Center. Nothing heavy, don't have to discuss anything. Just get to know you back and forth. We've become friends. And then you have a better way of talking. You develop a sense of trust. And it's hard to do that under these circumstances, I think. <clears throat> there, there's a nice theater in the White House. And President Reagan used to get a movie, a new movie. And he got a couple of movie stars to come and invite people to come. A little heavy thing, just have a nice time, see a movie, have a little reception afterwards, and you get to know people. And that's the way you do it. <coughs> so, and Tip O'Neill, somebody asked President Reagan if Tip was his adversary, he said, not after six o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so one final question. Uh, you, you, you have to be a profoundly optimistic human being to have lived the life you've lived. You've experienced America over the last century almost. Uh, what sustains your optimism? What gives you the most hope for the future? Well, I have seen time and time again that there's some big problem and we deal with it effectively. The US has a fantastic record of digging in and solving problems. And I think we can do that again. But I think there's something that's taking place I'm not so sure of this, but it's an observation. I think we see a new federalism emerging. Remember our founding fathers put together a constitution that basically said in, in the center there's going to be something that has to do with foreign policy and, and defense policy. But most things were left to the states and localities. And gradually the federal government has filled up that space. They even tell us how to run a bathroom. Come on. We figure out how to do it our way. So <clears throat> I think there's kind of a pushback starting. We're starting to say more, let's us figure out our problems and do something about them ourselves. And uh, I think more and more of that is starting to happen. So do you stand with Jerry Brown as he's now uh, uh, <coughs> actually making California great again? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're a pretty great state. And we have a lot of problems, but I, I love it here. I mean, have you gone outside recently? Not bad. <laughs> With that, let me say thank you very much, George Bush.